But Atlanta Startup Combos, you know, we, we built this in, in this community really to focus on builders, uh, folks who are getting that next customer, who are um, building the next piece of uh, the next feature to their product, and then providing a safe environment where you can showcase it to like-minded entrepreneurs who are also going through the same struggle. So we really appreciate everyone's time this morning. And we've got three great companies. Uh, the first one is Carly with Strapped um, Bending. And uh, Carly, we met through a CreateX and she has built um, a, 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 a hardware solution and uh, that, that she's gonna share more about. And uh, Carly, why don't you uh, take, take control and, and share more about uh, Strapped Bending. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, John. Let's see. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Carly Simenauer, and I'm the founder and CEO of Strapped. Really excited to be here with you all today. So without further ado, I'll get right into it. So Strapped is a company that's reinventing restroom vending, but we're not just a modern day vending manufacturer. We actually consider ourselves more of a vending based marketing platform. And at a high level, what we do is we've created a solution that leverages product sampling to connect users to new brands in a restroom environment. And it all started out with the dreaded tampon dispenser. For women, I'm sure you've seen these out and about. Um, and for the men in the room, uh, consider these the equivalent of, of the condom dispensers in men's rooms. It's pretty obvious they need some TLC. If they're available, they don't work. If, they're, if they work, they're not stocked. And if they stocked, it's with crappy products. Um, and if, you know, by some miracle, you find yourself a working stocked tampon dispenser filled with diamond crusted tampons, tell me when the last time is that you had a quarter on you, right? So these just don't work anymore. Uh, and neither does the model. Users don't trust these. And with really little incentive for facilities to even be offering these programs, they get left to rot on walls. And so Strap is tackling this issue by manufacturing and operating our own IoT dispensers that users can actually interact with using modern day technology. Um, that facilities don't have to worry about upkeeping because we actually take care of all of the maintenance. And these are designed to dispense a variety of products that women love most and to keep up with trends and preferences as they inevitably shift. And best of all, the products are totally free. So here's how it works. First, the user authenticates using a standard login option. And then similar to how, how we locate electric scooters, users can pull up a map and locate the nearest dispenser, see exactly what's inside and know that it's working and stocked before they even approach the machine. Once they get to the dispenser, they'll scan the QR code located on the front of the machine and select the product that they wanna vend. And once they vend, they'll meet the product back at the dispenser um, and be presented with the coupon code uh, from the brand that they've just vended from. And because they've authenticated, we can then push them promotional content and for our brands, provide them with a very curated customer list of users that they wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. And we're doing it this way because user sampling, it's not only really exciting for users, it's actually a really effective way for brands to drive conversions over a longer period of time. Um, the numbers do vary based on product, based on industry, but if we look at Birchbox, for example, they see 50% of their users go on to purchase from the brands that they've just tested. Glade is another really good example. Um, once they started putting samples in Walmart bags, they saw their sales increase by 83% in the first week alone. So we know that user sampling works and much better than digital advertising alone. But until now, brands haven't relied on user sampling nearly as much because there just hasn't been a really great way to do it. But now brands can participate with really minimal effort. So similar to how they pay for digital advertising, brands will pay us on a pay per vend basis to reserve dispenser space. They'll simply send us the products and we'll package and take care of the rest. 
We're also going to be collecting premiums from brands on user conversions through an affiliate marketing model. And finally, facilities will pay a monthly leasing fee to host us. To date, uh, we've released a small pilot of our initial alpha product sponsored by very popular feminine hygiene brand Lola. And we're continuing to iterate on our product to test at a larger scale. But we're going to start geographically small and focused on feminine hygiene products and, and other personal care products to begin with. As we're testing, one of our main goals is going to be proving out our model to brands to earn their buy-in and show them that, yes, we can actually bring them new customers. And as we scale, we're going to lean on our brand partners and other distribution and servicing companies that are already in restrooms across the country to get a lot of these dispensers out there a lot faster than we would be able to do by approaching facilities one by one. So we are really excited to hit the ground running and continue making progress in this new year. And I welcome anyone who's interested in learning more or about how you can help, or if you're interested in participating in our next pilot, um, please visit our website or feel free to reach out to me directly. With that, I will open it up for any questions. Really cool, Carly. The, um... And the uh, the Atlanta Tech Village has has uh, you you guys have signed an LOI, correct? On on uh, that is correct. That's great to hear. Really excited. So, what's your current uh, go to market right now? Is it is it you know first network and then and then next going to, to building owners or or what's your what, how do you get the word out? Um, yeah, right now we're definitely leveraging our network um, and also just, you know, cold calling facility managers. Um, we're, we're trying to get into a lot of schools um, and yeah, but, but first and foremost, definitely leveraging the network that we have. Wonderful. Um, well, feel free if anyone has any questions, either put it in, in chat and uh, we can we can share it um and then carla will you be around afterwards for a little bit yeah yeah i will okay great what is the cost so jason J yep go ahead yeah what is the cost of building these dispensers um so right now it's a bit higher than we eventually think it will be um it's around 200 dollars just because we're working with uh low volume manufacturing methods. Um, but hopefully we can soon get that to under $100 uh, per dispenser. And you got big, one more. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> how big is the market? How many restroom dispensers exist currently? And how often are they used? So there is not a lot of data on, on these really old dispensers. Um, I have searched near and far to, to figure out how many are out there and what, what the current situation looks like. But I can tell you that there are um, over 6 million commercial buildings in the US um, and, and we're trying to get into every single one of them. Um, and inside of every building, you can have anywhere from one to 20, 30 restrooms. Um, so, That's awesome. Well, if anyone has more questions, again, throw them in the chat. Um, and Carly, since she'll be here, um, if you you know if you want to connect with anyone, feel free to put your contact in there as well. Sure. Yeah, I will awesome. do that now. Um, I know Dave. Dave just put one more question in there, um, uh, but maybe you can answer that on chat, and we'll pop on to the next one if that works. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Great. 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 Well, Pierre, Pierre Dubois, just uh, love, love that name. Um, let me see. There we go. Oh. JC. Hey, hey, how are you? Pierre, why don't you, um, so, so Pierre, Pierre and I met uh, through uh, a mutual friend entrepreneur and um, originally uh, from, from, uh, 
Fritz and, and is now over here stateside uh, building the next the next marketplace for <clears throat> um, stylists and uh, consumers who are who don't want to go to the uh, I guess to the to the hairdresser. So Pierre, feel free to share more and and uh, and, and discuss the product market and all the things uh, that you're tackling right uh, now. John, John, you're good. I think you can do the presentation. No, no. <laughs> so hi, everybody. So I'm Pierre. Um, I'm French. Uh, and, and, and sorry for the for the strong accent and probably the, the language mistakes. So I'm going to I'm going to try to share uh, my screen with you. Uh, I guess it's like that. Sorry for that. Do you do you do you see it? Do you see the presentation? Yep, we do. Perfect. Great. So, um, so I'm Pierre, the founder of Dash Stylists. Um, so I, I started this venture um, about six months ago. ID is very simple. Um, what about someone you know that has uh, difficulties to go to the hair salon for many reasons? Obviously, senior citizens, but can also be busy professionals or um, or you know families with uh, young children. So the idea is okay. I like someone to come to my house and do my hair or my children's hair. Uh, how can I find those stylists or those barbers? And um, obviously, uh, mobile hairstyling exists in the US, but that's not something that has been really organized, or I mean, not at a, at a national scale. There, you know, a few years ago, there was a sort of a wave of, of companies created in this area. And they were, uh, but they are still limited to coastal uh, big cities like New York or Los Angeles. And for the rest of us, you know, probably so that's probably 90% of the, the rest of the US, there's almost nothing. So Dash Stylist is, is just about that. We connect uh, hairstylists and barbers to customers who need, I, and I, I, I'm going to explain that, who need to have their hair done at the house. Um, so, of course, the value for uh, customers uh, is, is its usefulness. The, the first upside, it's useful for these people. But also, um, mobile hairstyling should be affordable. Right now, most of the time, uh, it's uh, seen at its position as an upscale, uh, an upscale service, but there's no reason for that. I mean, other than um, historical and cultural reason, there is no economical reason for that. The overhead expenses or the commissions are, you know, way much lower uh, with mobile styling compared to what are the costs when you uh, have your hair done in a salon. It's a win-win situation because I think also that uh, it has a lot of upsides for the stylists. It's more money for them. And right now they need that. But even before um, this pandemic uh, environment, 80% um, of stylists are independent workers. So whatever... Um, you know, if they can make a few more bucks, you know, working for themselves uh, on their own conditions, well, that's that's uh, that's definitely an upside for them. And as I said, they do that in you know with Dash Talis, with total freedom. They get to decide their prices. They get to decide the services they offer. They get to decide the schedule. They get to decide the locations where they work in. The product in itself is the process is very similar to uh, so we are not a Uber of hairstylists. 
but if I if I bear the comparison, I would compare the process to Airbnb. So basically, you search around you, you enter your location. Uh, you might want to filter by by type of service. Then you are presented with a listing of stylists and barbers. You check the price, you check the services, you pick your stylist. Then you, once you have chosen your, your stylist or your barber, you just pick the date and the time because you can see the, the right in front of you the, in, in real time, the schedule of the stylist. So you can easily pick uh, the, 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 the date and time and confirm the booking. And basically that's it. Uh, a, few, a few hours or days later, the stylist is at your door and is, uh, is ready to, uh, to service you. Uh, <laughs> that's for the team, but uh, uh, so I started that with an, an experienced and local stylist, Gabriel, uh, six months ago. And so now we are, right now we are in Atlanta, especially the, the northern part of Atlanta. And we are expanding in Georgia and, uh, and out of Georgia uh, in uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, and, and Florida. Wonderful, Pierre. Wonderful. So, Pierre, you got you all have a, a traction in terms of paying customers right now, revenue. Um, can you can you share a little bit more about that? So, um, I um, this is the third company I, I'm starting. Uh, so, my idea was to start. Um, in real conditions. I wanted to start with the, 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 the real business model and the business model is the, the, a very classical, oh, sorry for the video. Uh, the, the business model is a very marketplace business model. It's a commission uh, that we take on everything the, the stylist charge to, to, uh, to the customers. So I wanted to start with the full commission. No, you know, like no free, uh, no free services, no free commission. I wanted to, honestly, I, I saw those first six months as a, as a real test, you know, as a, um, a, a test drive. It works or it doesn't work. I, I don't want to twist the model and, and after six months, oh yeah, it works. We have a lot of clients. We have a lot of uh, stylists, but okay, we are not taking any commission. So is it working if we are taking full commission? So yes, we started taking full commission uh, and uh, we, have, we definitely have a, a serious traction with the stylist. We have now a process that works and we have more stylists than we could hope and that than we could, we can, actually uh, display on the website and as for the customer yeah we got we got serious traction we we got a month of the month uh, um, i would say it's it's around you know uh, 50% uh, it's a, it's still a niche market but uh, honestly it's as i said it's my third startup and uh, it's it's probably the the, the best the best start that, that I've seen. That's, got, that's great. Oh, I was going to say, we've got lots of questions coming in. I might ask a couple here if that works. One sure. thing is, how do you, um, once, you, once you find a stylist, how do you prevent maybe a customer from going directly to them to avoid maybe those fees? I can't. <laughs> if, 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 they, if they want to uh, work around us, they will. But you know, uh, we are not the first one to ask this this question. Uh, Uber, Airbnb, all these companies they 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 made you know they they realized studies, and what they found out was it's it's about I would say that the average it's it's eight to ten percent, and we are ready to take that. And honestly, for us, you know, the the average uh, transaction value is. Uh, is uh, for you know for a man's haircut it's thirty thirty five dollars, so you know if they they work around us, they they got, they're gonna you know probably they're gonna save 
two, three dollars. You know, I, I'm not sure it's it's worth anything. And as far as we know, uh, because that's something we've been, you know, because it's a little bit upsetting that uh, it's not about the, the economic value. It's more about the, 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 the relationship we are trying to build with the stylists. And so far, we haven't detected any um, fraudulent or, you know, uh, behavior. I, you know, I, I'm sure it will happen. Sure, sure, sure. Well, can you tell us a little bit, maybe one more question, and then <coughs> there's a lot here, but I want to make sure and get to the next folks as well. But um, can you talk about like the verification process of like the credentials of a stylist? What what does that look like? Um, and then maybe what yeah, that's sure. like of, okay, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, that's perfect. Stop. Um, so, um, the, the stylist in the US, as you, you might know or, or not, uh, they are required to get a license with the, the state where they work in. And if they want to work in different states, they have to get a license in every state where they, 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 where they, they work in. So that, that's a strong, uh, that's already a strong screening process. And obviously we are checking the, 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 the validity of these, of these licenses. And the second, we add uh, a second layer to that. Uh, we have our own, let's call that hiring process because they are not employees, of course. Uh, but we screen them uh, more on the technical and behavioral uh, side because it's uh, for most of them it's you know mobile stylist is a new job it's it's they know how to cut and how to style hair no doubt but the way the the the, the customer relationship is completely different and they have to work with the customer and with the platform dash stylist so uh, we have to check that they have the technical uh, technical ability to do that and you know the the the, the versatility and the flexibility also um, so 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 far we have had no uh, incident with customers and and once again on the um, on the on the on the legal side uh, the, the 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 fact that there's a state license uh, helps us a lot on on the screening process. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Pierre, what, what are you looking for in terms of uh, next next hires, next next resources um, to get to the next stage? Knowing that there's a lot of questions, um, so you may either have to answer them in chat or uh, or afterwards. <clears throat> so right now we are uh, looking for uh, a seed round. Uh, around uh, 400, 500 K uh, to, to, you know, to build the team and uh, to start uh, expanding to other states. As I said, we have already started, but obviously it's going to need a little bit of, of funding for the, to build a good, you know, technical platform, because right now what we have is not good. Well, I mean, I think it's not good. It works. Uh, you can see that as an MVP, but it's 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 not what what I, I, I'd like it to be. And uh, and and then obviously marketing, you know, uh, marketing expenses because we're gonna have to make this sort of service more popular. And 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 you know we have to raise the awareness. So that that's that's the next move, and and I hope that we can raise the money in the in the very next month, and uh, we can expand probably to uh, six or seven states in the in the next twelve to uh, to eighteen months. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, Pierre, thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thank you. And um, uh, JC, was there anything else we wanted to add? No, I think there's a lot here, <laughs> Pierre. If you want to be uh, kind of in the chats, lots of good questions here. Um, and then, of course, are you going to be sticking around at the end in, in case there's something else? Yeah, sure. Great, great, great. Yeah. 
let's bring on um, a few others. And if you want to just maybe be in the chat a little bit, um, lots of great questions here. Okay. Yeah, very, very much so. All right, wrapping up uh, the, the third company and presenters, um, Chris and Amon from Gather Lee uh, and another CreateX company. So shout out to, to that program and, and what, they're, what they're building over there. Uh, Raul's uh, really done some amazing organizing and, and uh, I see Chris smiling right now. Um, but uh, the uh, Chris and Amon, why don't y'all, why don't y'all take it away? And, and uh, you know, I, you hear things around the, around the local scene of just Gatherly and, and uh, how much traction y'all have gotten and, and, uh, and how it's um, being used from interviews to uh, a better Zoom. So really excited to see the product and more. Well, you know, hopefully, John, they're not listening too closely to our, uh, our presentation here. Um, but, you know, if they are, then maybe they can pick up some pointers, right? Let me go ahead. Yep. Uh, can you guys see my screen all right? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, hey, so, you know, this, this is actually a really a salient topic, I guess, because, you know, we're in the middle of a, a networking session. You know, huge shout out to, to JC and your team right now. I think one of the biggest pickups that we've learned in virtual events is that it really depends on the energy and the excitement of the hosts. And you guys have been killing it today. So really, really appreciate that. Um, one thing that we're looking to add to that, though, is this idea of like, how do we bring real world in-person events onto the virtual like you know, platforms and virtual world? And I think a lot of difficulty today comes from this idea that these Zoom rooms that we're in right now, for example, like have these like walls of faces. And it's really hard sometimes to personally interact with one or two people. And you know, here JC did a great job of throwing us all into breakout rooms so that we you know, can pare that down, have a little bit more digestible like circle rather than seeing all 300 or you know, as many faces in this room or maybe a larger Zoom session would have like 300 faces and being able to really pare that down. So you know, Aman, myself and a couple of other folks over at the Gatherly team started thinking about, well, hey, what does an in-person event really look like, right? And we picked out three major ideas from these in-person events that we really wanted to keep in mind as we were building a platform. So, you know, we think first about the spontaneity. There's no calendar scheduling. You don't need to like, you know, grab someone's time. You can quite literally just walk up to them and meet someone new really quickly. And with that, like, you know, being able to meet someone quickly, that comes with a choice of conversation. You don't need to like, you know, be able to, um, you know, like get randomly like sorted into a room sometimes, or you can really just be intentional about who you want to meet. You might see someone like, you know, John and really want to go chat with them about their, you know, your product or maybe even like get like a quick pitch in, right? Um, and then the other thing that you see is that there are huddles of people rather than this like one giant lobby. So the way that, you know, I've, I've typically thought about it is that you imagine walking into a hotel lobby instead of, you know, these pockets of conversation that you're so used to. Sometimes you on these Zoom calls, you see 300 faces staring at you, which sometimes is unnerving. So being able to bring back that sense of pockets of, or huddles of conversation was really important to us. So with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to my co-founder, Amon, to do a quick demo of the product so you can see like, you know, what we're up to and how this works. You're mute. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank, thank you, Chris. Um, so like Chris was mentioning, what we're trying to do at Gatherly is to be a better platform for online networking. You know, I think a lot of these early video chat platforms like Zoom and Teams were really built for meetings of 20 people, but, you know, not many platforms have been built for online networking. The main challenge that we saw was trying to come up with a platform that works extremely well for, you know, uh, online networking, but also imitates that real life experience of being in a building. And so we wanted to make it simple. So we actually copied exactly the experience of what it's like to be in a building. So first, when you enter a gatherly space, you enter a welcome lobby, kind of like real life. And so when you enter that welcome lobby, you're able to be alone, but you're also able to walk up to someone. So for example, in this welcome lobby, I see Chris, and if I click on him, I'll actually en end up in a video call with him right over here. Uh, the video won't play just because uh, we're both in, we're in, on two video calls at the same time right now. But that being said, the, the way this works is you're able to join conversations if you'd like to. And one example, I'll go, go ahead and show is what this looks like with 50 people. So you'll see on the skiff here, you'll see two types of entities. You'll see circles and squares. So circles are those pockets of conversations. This is a five-person conversation, four-person conversation, et cetera. And squares are people currently not in conversations. So you'll see Chris, Lisa, uh, Sean, et cetera. They're all walking around the room trying to find conversations to enter. 
the, where this gets really interesting is when you scale this up beyond just 50 people and into a range that is more like 500 people. In real life, an event that's 500 people probably doesn't even happen in one room. It probably happens in many rooms. And so we like to think of ourselves like a digital building, where if you go to the elevators, you can actually switch to different floors, like the conference room. I'll go ahead and show one example that we really like to show, which of how this concept can be quite powerful of copying real life, which is a, the Rice Academic Fair. Um, this, this is a 2000 person event. In real life, it happens in the building at Rice. That's you know 10 stories. They have like hundreds of tables. And it was a really big challenge for them to na ma navigate that this would go online this year. The way they built this in Gatherly is they said, okay, we're gonna make a building. We're going to have many different floors. So, and within those different floors, we'll say maybe a humanities floor, a social sciences floor, an architecture floor, and a music floor. We're going to have a map design that within each floor that has many different tables. So maybe in one floor, there's you know table A, table B, table C, table D. In real life, they would have some sort of brochure that would tell you, okay, all these tables are here. And you know, here's how you navigate around our Rice Academic Fair building. On Gatherly, they had the exact same thing through an event info tab. The way they designed their event info tab is seen here, where you'll see that they constructed the different floors around different subjects. And then within each subject, they said floor two humanities, table G is where our Spanish class is. Within floor three humanities though, table G is where Engl the English teacher will be. And so they were able to construct a building just like real life and navigate thousands of people. So I think where the concept becomes powerful is that just like real life, you can have a 50 person event in a building, but you can also have a very large event. Um, at a high level, that's how our platform works. Um, we've seen a lot of interest from colleges. That's you know where a lot of our initial team, you know, we are just new grads or you know current college students. We're looking to uh, expand upon some of our early corporate interests. We've seen huge interest, particularly from marketing managers and HR managers. So our ask would be if there's any intros anyone can have in those spaces, that would be great. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm excited to answer any questions. Yeah, I see that uh, Dave just asked um, about Clubhouse. I actually heard about them, I think at the end of last week and I got signed up on Monday. So just getting started to um, just getting started to know them, but really cool that you, you brought that up so early. I'm glad that, you know, we're hearing uh, good information then. Yeah, lots of good validation in the market. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, so on y'all's website, you, you mentioned, you know, over 1500 organizations. So how, how, how have y'all gotten the word out right now? What's, what's the, the customer usage? Uh, it's gotta be fun, right? Yeah. yeah. It, you know, I think the, the most powerful thing that I've seen that really, you know, keeps me waking up in the morning and really, really excited to get to work is our customer referrals. So we see this really cool flywheel effect where every single event that's hosted is essentially a product demo for maybe like, you know, 300 people at once. And a lot of these people in the events industry are really, really well connected. For example, we just had a, a new startup sign up to our software for an enterprise deal out of Silicon Valley. And they heard about us through a marketing manager over at Figma that attended a holiday party. So it's just like this really, really cool flywheel of referrals and people that just demo the product by being at the event. Yep. You know, there's, there's definitely that, that organic virality. Um, you see, um, there's a question here from Suzanne. Um, big companies use apps to help with conferences, to schedule events, speakers, et cetera. Do you envision the same with Gatherly? Yeah. And I can actually, I see the uh, comment from Eric as well about differentiating with services like Hopin. So I think those two questions actually go pretty well together where I think, you know, there's, there's two aspects to the event. First is the actual event itself, right? Like, what Aman just showed you. And then there's this whole other backend for event hosts that we didn't really talk about during our, our quick presentation. A lot of that comes with the ability to schedule things, put them on their, like, you know, put the event onto like individuals calendars, enable sharing, um, and just really think of like perhaps the complete post, or excuse me, pre to post event experience. That's things that we're slowly like building out. That also ties into like what Hopin is doing. So I see that Suzanne mentioned like speakers in particular. Our platform is really, really focused on the networking aspect of things. We do have a broadcast mode as well as like panel discussion mode as well. But I mean, full transparency, Hopin knocks that out of the water. But where they really like, you know, where they really start to like falter is perhaps their like randomized one-on-one -on -one networking, where we're continuing to dive into new features like, you know, business cards or like more in like empowering like, you know, LinkedIn connections and analytics and being able to really build those features out is where we see our differentiation and what we're going to continue building on. 
Great. Yeah. One more question there. What about the sponsor side of things? What options does Gatherly offer for sponsors? Yeah, that's actually something that we just recently started tackling with our customer discovery. So a lot of our, like, I, I suppose, went like last winter sprint was around just learning as much as we could about event hosts. Now we're actually opening up their contact books to understand what event sponsors need. So those would be actually those like booths that Amon showed you. The vendors would probably be in those spaces. And what we're quickly learning is that they're all about the data and figuring out like, oh, this customer joined like my huddle three or four times. I really want to know their contact information and why they were interested, right? So that's like one area where we think we're going to be able to start providing a lot of value once we flush out those features as well. Awesome. awesome. Nice. What does the team look like right now? Yeah, so we're a little bit of a larger team. Um, I, I guess like because we actually hired a lot of like college students to work alongside us and just ship out features as fast as possible. Um, so a lot of our engineering team right now is college students and we're slowly expanding to full-time hires. Right now, we actually just last night made our, our uh, sixth full-time hire. So slowly expanding, mostly engineering, but we'll still like soon move towards like hiring more sales folks as well. That's great, that's great. Uh, I see the clapping emoji, Dave. Love that. 